Check, 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 check. All right. So it's going to get warm because you're in Hill City, yo. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is Okambani. So it, it's summer here all the time. And so I want to just give you some tips on surviving afternoon after lunch in Ukambani. Any people from Ukambani in the house? Can I hear? Yes, yes, yes. Hey! The whole of, Machak, the whole of Mavuno Church is from Ukambani. I, I didn't know that. So, so, so here's the thing. When you start feeling like you're moving forward, involuntarily, that is not the Holy Spirit. So I want to just encourage you, when you start to feel something, stand up, stand at the back, and you know what? The wind will hit your face, you'll listen, and then you'll come back and sit. If you see your neighbor moving forward, involuntarily, that is not the Holy Spirit. So what do you do, what do, you do to your neighbor? <laughs> You guys are so violent. <laughs> we are a family. We love each other. So just wake them up gently. Tell them, brother, sister, it is time. Arise. Go to the back and shine for Jesus. Amen. And I will not take it personally. If you feel like standing and standing at the back as I'm talking, that's okay as well. And Pastor James and the team, if you need to drop a couple more flaps, uh, feel free to do that if it will help us stay awake. Amen. Amen. Come on, give a big shout to Jesus. We love you, Lord. Woo! Amen. Please have your seats. Please be seated. Um, you know, if you had told me two years ago that Mavunites would be taking time off work and coming and spending four days just listening to God's word, I would have told them, you don't know my church. My church are cool peoples like that. They're busy. They have jobs. What a shock. What a shock. Look at your neighbor. Just say, what a shock. It's so good to see you here. I'm so glad you're here. My goodness, let me just tell you, impartation comes to those who tarry. Pastor, Pastor Kelonzi told us that. And so as you're here, the blessing is, is yours. It really is yours. God today had a, such a specific... This was not actually the agenda I initially had to talk about sonship and about family and about fatherhood. But I really had a strong compassion in my spirit. That's what God wanted us to cover today. There's more. To your neighbor, there's more. There's more. There's something that God wants us to really dig into this weekend. So tomorrow, tomorrow, we, tomorrow is when we actually start discussing the things that God wanted us to discuss in this uh, gathering. So we haven't started yet, but there were some things that God wanted us to deal with foundationally before we move into the harder things. Amen. So this is just a way for us to just get on the same page, uh, be together, start understanding the season that God has brought us into. It's interesting because this was not our culture. It's not something that we anticipated. I went to a very cool church called Nairobi Chapel. I was brought up in ministry there. We did great things for God. It was a fantastic and thriving church. All this stuff about fatherhood, family, sonship was never taught to me. And I just don't think it was... The, I mean, I, I didn't see the value of it, to be honest. And to be honest, I'm still learning as I go just how important it is because it's not something that I, I grew up understanding. There is such a power. There is such a power when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. Notice Psalm 133 doesn't say how blessed it is when church members dwell together in unity. It doesn't say how blessed it is when... What other things? Best friends dwell together in... BFFs dwell together... Associates. It doesn't say any of that. It says when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. And then it starts talking about the fact that there's a blessing that comes from above. It flows down from Aaron's, the head, to the, to the beard, to the hem of the garments. It comes, blessing always goes vertically to brothers and sisters, not to colleagues or strangers or prodigals. And so I really am coming to understand that there's a strong, strong uh, thing that begins to happen. And part of it is, even when my mind was not understanding it, I could see the results. You know, sometimes some of us, we need to see something. So if I'm not getting it here, then I need to at least see, is it working? Is it working? 
it's working. It's working. Uh, God is doing something. And so I really believe God wants us to lean into this thing, not to watch from the outside, but to lean in, not to be prodigals who are away or who are inside the house, but to lean in. Now, I want to just, uh, it's, it's interesting because Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15, it tells us something about Jesus. And I think I talked about that this, this last Sunday uh, as we are going through the January sermon. How many of people were blessed by the January sermon? Yeah? God's word, God's word to us is that, my goodness, this year we are going to be strong and do exploits. But you know, it starts with people who know. Yeah? Exploits come from knowing. And so this is what God was telling us in January. This is how you're going to get to know me this year. And so uh, Jesus went on a mountainside called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. Let's read that part together from there. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out. Come on, read it. To preach and have authority to drive out demons. You know, it's very interesting that this was Jesus. We talked about that on Sunday. This was Jesus. He was about to change the world. He was coming with a purpose. He wanted to change this world and bring it back to God, make it what God intended it to be, to have rule and dominion over all the planet. And the first thing he does after he comes from fasting, boom, he appoints 12. And he tells us he appoints them so that they can be with him and so that he can send them out. That there are two things he wants to do with them, to be with and to send out. Now, I shared these five levels of mobilization. Let me recap them for those of you forgotten. If you have that, the, the, the five levels, you guys remember this? Yeah. Every church, at some point or the other, might have five levels of people. Sometimes they end up with just one level. Attendance. The people who are there for the blessing and the inspiration. I move from church to church looking for the best word, looking for the most inspiration. Where is prophet so-and-so? Where is preacher so-and-so? Where is minister so-and-so? And when they come to town, I say goodbye to the place I normally go, and I go and look for that word and that impartation. And many people are in that space. Many Christians are in that place. I remember one person telling my wife and I very proudly that they, uh, they know every sermon that Pastor T.D. Jakes had preached. And... I asked him, do you know every sermon that your pastor has preached? Because he was from Deliverance Church, and I knew his pastor, uh, Bishop J.V. Masindi. I said, do you know every sermon that... And I could see a bit of confusion there, like, how, what does that have to do with anything? So he's basically in the house, but he's not of the house. Wow. Yeah? He's, he's, he knows more about what people are preaching in America than what is going on in his own house. And that's an attender. Attender is just there to receive. When there's a great thing that's happening that's amazing, they're there. When it's not something that works, they're not. When Pastor Kilons is preaching, they're there. Because it's like I get, that isn't he anointed? Come on, somebody. Yeah, when he's preaching, I'm there. When it's Pastor so-and-so that Pastor Kilonzi has asked to preach because Pastor Kilonzi is somewhere else. What do they do? I go back to T.G. Jakes. <laughs> I go to Steve Furtick. There are many other good preachers. I stay home that day because it's not what I want. I didn't buy in for that. So attenders are there because of the service you give them. And the nicer your church is, the more attenders you'll have. It's not a bad thing, by the way, to have attenders because people have to start somewhere. But just be aware that attenders come for the benefits. Now, um, many churches, traditional churches, know we move them. We move them to membership. You don't want to leave people just sitting there in the chairs. You want them to become members. You want them to serve. You want them to be in a small group. You want them to, to connect. You want them to uh, engage, to give, to tithe, to become a part of the community. And membership is about belonging and contributing. So somebody is able to say, this is my church. It's not a church I attend. This is my church. And I serve in this church. I'm an elder. I'm a pastor. Uh, sorry, uh, an usher. I'm a musician. This is a place where I serve. And that's where many churches are very happy to have you there. The higher you go, you become an usher. You move from being an usher, you become a worship team minister. And then what do you become? Deaconess. You become a deaconess. Come on, somebody. And then you become a minister. And then you become a past, an associate pastor. Then you become, it's like, this is, it's like a progression. But basically what it is, is your belonging and your contributing. And many churches, this is where they are. Many mega churches... This is where they are. And I put it very gently that this is where Mavuno was for a long time. We didn't know it. We didn't think it. We've always been the fearless. 
but there's something that was missing. And there's a new level, a different realm, that is the family. It's a family. Family has to do with identity and sonship. Now, let me say this. I want to just say this sensitively. I, I don't actually think we didn't have family. I think we did. We had pockets of family within Mavuno. So it's not to say we never had or experienced uh, family, but it was not an intentional thing. We did not structure around it. We did not make it a focus. And when you don't make it a focus, the thing that you make the focus is what becomes a focus. And so that because it wasn't there as strongly, there were people who had identity and sonship, but it was not even the language we used in the house. Uh, in, a, in a family, you're not there. Family is forever. You heard Pastor Angie say that. For, family is forever. You don't have a, you're not here for a season. You're not here until the next great church starts in town. You're not here because of what you're getting or because you have an opportunity to serve and then you feel, okay, I've outgrown this church. You, don't, you never outgrow your family. You'll always be, it doesn't matter how old you are, your father will always be your father. Your mother will always be your mother. You don't outgrow family. And so family is a place of identity and sonship. It's a place I say I get my identity from. My name is from here. Uh, this is where my ID says I'm from. <laughs> this is my family, my spiritual ID. I get to heaven, I say, yeah, I'm a son of the kingdom of God. My cabranch. Subdivision, Subdivision. location. <laughs> Mavuno. <laughs> Sublocation, downtown. Huh? Village, <laughs> 360, <laughs> you know? So, so that's, that's a place that God planted me. And that's a place that gives me my family. And that's a place I have a father and I have a mother and I have sons and daughters as well. Because it's not just about having a father, it's about becoming a father as well. I have people that I am discipling as well and I'm pouring into. But we say that that is the opening. Family is the key. Family is actually the key. Because without family, you can't move to where God wants you to be, which is army. Now, army is very important because army is the thing that wins wars. We know that we're in a spiritual battle, don't we? We know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers of, this, of the dark world. And to win that war, we cannot win it by being disorganized civilians. We have to become an army. The only way to become an army is through the root of family. I, told, I, I remember one day talking to some people and they asked, but... but, but, but um, army feels hard. It doesn't feel warm. Family feels very warm. And I say to them, you don't understand army when you think that. People who are in the army will tell you the army is one of the tightest families there ever was. When you go out to that unit of people who are there with you in that invasion force, the people around you are your brothers and sisters. You've been trained to die for them. I don't know if you would die for your brother and sister, by the way. I'm just trying to say there are other levels of family. Because many of our families, we're family because we belong, but we're not families because we have a cause. Army is when the family gets a cause and starts living for something bigger than just themselves. And so at that point, you need discipline and following. It's about rank. It's about order. It's not about, you can't all shout charge. We have to recognize who shouts charge in this place. Whose order do we listen to? And you don't have the general talking to everybody in an army. There has to be order. The general, when he says charge, he actually doesn't say charge to the whole army. He doesn't broadcast. He sits with his brigadiers and the people next to him, and he says charge. And they relate to their, their units in the field. There's a Navy guy. There's an Army guy. There's a, a, an Air Force guy. And they say, this is a strategy. The strategy is not given to everyone at once. Wow. This guy sits in a situation room, and he's got his generals, and they're the ones who take that to the next level and the next level. That's what the army is about. It's understanding rank. It's understanding where you fit and what your role is. Families are about individuality. In the family, you're like, this is a second born, we know her. She kind of comes home when she wants. She's always late. She answers back. She's the one, even the parents, I'm not sure what to do with. Am I talking to a second born in the house? This is a third born who is always nice and everybody likes them. They don't offend people. They are always the one when we are fighting, they bring people together, third borns. This is a first born who is the substitute parent who we never even talk when they we never even say anything because we know it will reach our parents. Oh, the assistant Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm offending some people. They look at me, not some firstborns are not smiling right now. You know, in families, it's about individuality. Every child is different. Don't we say that as parents? Every child is special. Every child is different. This one, you don't even have to encourage them. They read. This one, you have to sit with them and help them do their homework. Every child is different. Good parents know that. In an army, there is no such thing as difference. I can't be here 
as a sergeant commanding a platoon and I'm like, this one I have to tell them, let's charge please. <laughs> this one already has charged because they don't even wait for orders. This one, we have already lost the battle before we die. We are dead before we start, isn't it? In an army, they beat the difference out of you because they understand that difference is what will kill you on the battlefield. In an army, the one thing that distinguishes you is how quickly you understand the command to charge and how devoted you are to defend one another and to live for the bigger cause. That's what armies are about. It's a very different level of family. But you will never get there unless you build a trust. So what do they do in the army? They take you to boot camp. And in boot camp, they, they torture you. <laughs> it looks like torture, by the way. But what are they doing? They're creating a sense of identity. They're creating a sense of resilience. By the time you come out of there, you look at each other and you're like, we survived together. By the way, anyone you went to boot camp with when you're in the army is your brother for life. You will die for them. You will see them in trouble. You will not leave them behind on the battlefield. And that's what the army is very clever about. They're like, we have to create a sense of oneness between these people and a code that is bigger, that is going to make them willing to die. Armies don't, don't uh, you know, talk about individuality. You know how in, in every single person in Kenya, you get your ID when you're 18, and, and now, I mean, it's like, I know when you're going for your ID picture, you don't, it's going to mark you for life. So you make sure you put on your makeup and you're hoping you look as good as you can. And you're smiling because you're like, oh God, this had better go well. Because that smile, you know how the camera takes off before you're ready. That's you for the rest of your life. You'll be showing, even the guys, are the, the guys will be looking at you and they start laughing. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like you have to compose yourself. It's your ID. It's your thing. It's your identity. You know the first thing they do when you get to the army? They take those IDs and throw them away. And they give you a military ID. And that ID tells you you're no longer, <laughs> you're no longer Kenyan. You belong to the military first. You're a servant of this nation. All of you come with your hairstyles. Some of you like box. Others of you like you know how, I mean, hairstyles, I'm just looking at this room, it's just full of hairstyles. If an alien landed in this room, it would be confused. What are those things on their head? Everybody has individuality, nice hairstyles. Go to the army, one prescription haircut. Everybody gets the haircut. We don't want to waste time with hairs. Everybody, like the armies don't think the same way as civilians think. Have you noticed that? They think very differently. And so the army, it may look like a tough place, but when a war starts, you'll be happy you're in that space. Because anything below that dies. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. So God wants, he talks about the, the, the church being an army. It is an army. The Bible talks about that. It uses those metaphors. We wage warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not, it's not, it's not, it's not civilians who carry weapons of warfare. It is armies. So the Bible has many references that show the church is meant to be an army. And you know what? When you become an army, then you can actually do what the church was ever meant to do, which is to become a movement. Armies are able to deploy, and movement is an, a movement is an army in deployment. That's what a movement is. Go and make disciples of nations. That's, an, that's a movement that Jesus is talking about. But you can't just send out civilians to make disciples. You send out a deployed movement. You know, at Mavuno, and I'll give you this other little thing, back in the day, we sent out people. Mavuno has always been a sending church. And we would come and we would challenge people and say, you're fearless. Go and change nations. Go start a frontline initiative. Go start something. But you know the problem is, when you send a member to be an army person without any family support, they go out, they are motivated, they have all the passion, and they get killed. Because they have no backup. So we sent out people who started frontline initiatives, and they were fantastic people, but you know what happened? They were isolated, they were surrounded by the world, and very soon many of our front lines have become NGOs. I'm saying this not with any pride. I say it with sadness because that's not, that's not what we intended to do. But you started something that was very Jesus-centered, but now it's just as good as any NGO. And so many Christian organizations began like that. They started as very saved, very spirit-filled. Huh? Young Men Christian Association started as a very saved, very, it was something to spread the gospel. Today, it's just a health club. It doesn't have anything to do with its founder's vision. And that's what happens to armies 
that go out without any family. People who go out as units without any support. And that's why God has been teaching us about family in this season. Because it's like, here's your missing layer. You get this right, you will change the world. Mavuno, you'll change the world, by the way. I'm convinced that this church will change the world. The people of this church, global influence is yours, by the way. And some of you, I'm saying this, but when it happens, you will remember. Because right now, you may not believe it. But when it happens, you will remember your global influence. And it came out of being part of this family. And so you want to be able to understand these levels of engagement. And to ask yourself, where are you? Ask your neighbor, where are you? <laughs> Which one of these are you? Like, can you identify yourself there? Oh, don't share with your neighbor. Some of you are looking shy. Okay, just share with yourself internally. Where are you really? Where are the majority of people in your compass? Where would you think they are? Are they in the army? Are they in the movement? Are they attenders? Where do you think your people are? Now, this is so important because as you can see in the diagram, which is the key that turns this whole thing into what Jesus wants it to be? Family. It's family. If we want to be obedient to Jesus, go and make disciples. Let me, why would Jesus, at the time that he's leaving and he's about to go, he knows he's about to be killed and to be persecuted and to, and to die, and all he's telling his disciples is love one another, guys. Please, guys, just love each other. They are breaking bread at the Holy Communion. I mean, at the, the Last Supper, he's like, guys, if there's one thing I could tell you, just love one another. Love, like, what does love one another have to do with this thing? You're about to die. What does this have? It has everything to do with it. Because Jesus, Jesus knows if these people can love one another, he says, the world will know me. The world will know that I sent you if you love one another. That's the power of this thing that is called family. So I want to just talk about a few things about why, why family? Why does God want us to be a family? Today I said God wants us to understand this thing of family. If we get this right, nothing will be impossible for us. And so why family? The first thing is it distinguishes us from the world. It distinguishes, in fact, it distinguishes us from the world and to the world. So from the world, it sets us apart from the world. To the world, it helps the world to understand that we are different. It's what sets us apart. Do you understand that it's not religion that sets you apart from your neighbors? You understand that? That there are people with even better religion than you. Religion is a model of approaching God. There are people who can tell you, you have only one model. Us, we have three million gods. You choose who has more backup. <laughs> If it's about religion, there are people who have better, they have more religion than you do. Religion doesn't set Christians apart. Rituals don't set us apart. Going to church doesn't set us apart. There are people who do that. Fasting doesn't set us apart. There are people who live and laugh at your fasting because they fast more. Teaching people doesn't set you apart because there are people who even teach more radically than you. Even discipleship doesn't because there are people who disciple. I mean, by time, how many Christians have you seen putting on a, a vest to go and blow themselves because they believe? Yeah, there are people who can disciple better, out-disciple us. The one thing that sets you apart is love. This thing called following Jesus, it's the only place in the world you find a place that says God loves you just the way you are. And that God's first relationship with you is as a father. And that God wants a relationship with you as you are, and he's the one who will help you draw to him. All other religions are about what do you need to do to push yourself to God. In Christianity, it's, it has been done. You're not fighting for victory, you're fighting from victory. That's what sets you apart. So love is what sets us apart. John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. People are so different. People should come into your campus and say, my God, what is so wrong? What's up with these people? Like who loves each other like this? Like, 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 who, 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 like, there's something unique about these people. I've never felt this kind of love. And I can tell you, there's no other place in the world where love is a distinguishing factor. And love is not the love of the world. It's love, love is a self-dying love. It's a submit to one another kind of love. It's a, it's a putting up other people's needs above yours. It's, a, it's about none of them was hungry because they all sacrificed to make sure that everybody had food. That's the book of Acts. And the Bible says, and people were added to their numbers daily because people walked in and they're like oh my god what is this it's not even miracles that set us apart they're miracles in other religions it is love 
So this is why family is so important because God knew this is the thing that will symbolize and tell people that they are different. These are my followers. Number two, it helps people learn to love and serve God. Uh, 1 John 4.20 it says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sisters is a liar. Oh my gosh. I love Jesus. How about sister so and so? Aish! You've just lied. Like you cannot love Jesus if you can't love that sister. That's such a convicting thing. Is there somebody by the way you can't really stand? I stopped going there. I'm frozen. Is there someone you can't stand? Because the Bible has just called you a liar. <laughs> I love you forever. I love you forever. <laughs> liar! liar. Wow. You liar! That's what, that's what, you liar. Because wow. you hate your brother. You haven't talked to them forever. Since they took the money of the family and ran away with it, you've hated them. You can't stand him. And then you're here lying that you love God. The Bible says you can't. If you hate your brother, it says it. Or your sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have not seen cannot love God whom they have seen. That's why he says, put up, put, leave the gift in the altar. God even says, just leave that gift at the altar. Just leave it there. Go fast and be reconciled. And then come and offer that gift. Because your gift is a lie. And so what is he saying? Listen, as we love one another... We are modeling what it means to love God. Because you cannot love God if you cannot love the brother who's next to you. So family, that's what family does. Because some people say, I, I love church, I just can't stand Christians. Liar. Yeah, but that's a very cool thing to say nowadays. People say it on social media all the time. I, I, I love Christ. I love Jesus. I have no problem with Christianity or, or spirituality. It's just Christians I can't stand. That's a liar. The Bible tells you and calls you a liar to your face because you don't actually love God. You just love yourself. Number three, accelerates growth and healing. Accelerates growth and healing. This is why family is so important. You know, it's interesting because Isaiah 4, 54 verse 3 says, For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in desolate cities. I love that scripture. You know, Jesus, God talking to his family He's saying, your descendants will dispossess nations. He's talking to them, but he doesn't say you. He says, your descendants. You can't have descendants by yourself. You need a family. Hey. Family is how you dispossess nations. Some of you are saying, God, the Bible says, ask of me and I will give you the nations. And I'm like, yes, Lord, I want nations. I want to impact globally. God is saying the only way you'll ever impact is if your descendants will dispossess the nations. By the way, I tell you guys, I have global influence. But part of the reason I have global influence is because I have global sons and daughters. Wow. My sons and daughters will do greater things than I, than I am, and I'm discipling them to do greater things than me. So because of Pastor James and Dorcas, because of Pastor Milton and Vivian, because of Pastor Kevin and Faith, because of Pastor Godwin and Noel, because of Pastor Sheila and Abu, because of Pastor Victor and Z, because of because of my descendants, nations will be dispossessed. By the way, my nations are my portion. Before I die, Amen. there will be a Mavuno church in... I don't even want to say all the nations. Let me just say it. In all the nations of this world. Yeah. But I can't do that if I don't have descendants. I can't do that if I don't have descendants. Uh, if I have employees, I can never have that. Only descendants can dispossess nations for you. That's why family is so important, guys. If you want to have a global impact, if you want to live a, an influence beyond yourself, then have descendants. This is why we say in Mavuno Church, everybody is a disciple maker. It doesn't matter if you're 15 in this meeting today. You can be discipling people who are 12 and 13 and form a spiritual family and become a spiritual father and mother. We actually have spiritual fathers and mothers who are in this church who are 12 years old. Pastor Godwin in his church has, how old are your, some, of your disciple, some of your disciple leaders, your DG leaders? No, the ones in Marion. 13, 14. And they have, fam they have families. They're spiritual parents. They even know they're spiritual parents. They're looking, you, when did you become a spiritual parent, by the way? Like they're 13, 14, and they have spiritual descendants. Every one of us, this is how we dispossess nations. This is how we accelerate the growth of what God wants. God asks 
ask of me and I'll give you nations. It's only through spiritual sons and daughters. Number four, it creates the context for obedience. It creates the context for obedience. You know, it's interesting. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 to 7 says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. You know, it's very interesting because Jesus told us to make disciples of nations. But the context for discipleship, impress them on your children. You have to impress the commands of Jesus on your children. Jesus says, make disciples of nations, teaching them to obey. Who's taught to obey? Who do you teach to obey? It's children. And Jesus is saying, I want you to teach obedience. And so if you want to make disciples of nations, if you want to teach obedience, then you have to have descendants. You know, it's very interesting. For a long time, I taught sermons in Mavuno. By the way, I've taught many sermons in Mavuno Church. I have a folder with the sermons I've preached since I started this church. There are many. There are many. And I can't tell you how many times I've taught something. What an example. I've taught people about money. About don't get in debt. Debt is the devil's trap. Then we have a prayer service. Pastor, pray for me. Oh, why am I praying? Now, last month, my husband, last year, my husband and I took this debt, and now they're coming for our things, and we just need the pastor. And I'm looking at you like, why are you in Mavuno Church last year when I say that this thing will put you in debt and it will put you, make you a slave? And they're, they're coming to you without f pray for me because basically my teaching was a suggestion. That's what I was suggesting to them because they were not sons and daughters. They took that as a suggestion. Perhaps Pastor M thinks that we should not be in debt. You know what? When there's no obedience, there's no progress. And I found people going around in circles and not progressing. And I remember one day asking Pastor Carol, how is it that our spiritual children are not progressing financially? Why is it that we're not seeing kingdom millionaires and billionaires? And it struck us it's because we teach suggestions. And so we started not teaching suggestions, we started giving instructions. And so a year ago, I told this church, the Lord is saying, thus says the Lord. And by the way, I prayed about it, so I was not making it up. Everyone in this church must get out of debt because it is not God's will for you in Christ Jesus, for you to be a slave. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So throw off that yoke of slavery. My goodness, how many people are out of debt? How many people are, are, are almost out of debt because of that instruction? Let me just see, show of hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That had never happened all the years I was in Mavuno Church. I was just suggesting, suggesting, suggesting. Which means I was not obeying Jesus because Jesus says teaching them to obey. Yeah? So if you want people to obey, if you want to be a disciple maker, you have to create family because only family obeys. The people hired me as the father and they followed because Pastor M said it. And some of you, by the way, you've seen miracles because you chose to obey that instruction. You've come out of places you are not supposed to come out of because you chose to obey that instruction. And that's what happens when you begin to understand the importance of family. Family fosters generosity. It fosters generosity. Acts chapter 22, verse 4, verse 44 to 5. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. When you have family, you become the answer to each other's prayers. That's the beauty of it. You know, there's some prayers God doesn't really need to be bothered with. Come on. Yeah. There's some prayers that the answer is already here. And God is just scratching his head thinking, surely, you should be praying for other things now. You're asking me for a job. There are people here who can give jobs to you. Yeah, there are employers here who are putting their jobs on LinkedIn as opposed to bringing them to their fellowship. And people are jobless. And not understanding that this is my family. My children cannot be hungry and I'm putting job advertisement on LinkedIn. That's not understanding your role as a family. And there are people here who don't have food for eating, and somebody has, money, has food. In fact, they even go to throw it out, of, out because it's, there's too much food in their fridge. And they're not understanding, my goodness, I have a responsibility. If you understand these are your family members, you think very differently. And that's why the Bible said no one had any need among them. It was not a miracle. Nobody came like Jesus to multiply loaves and fishes in the early church. But there was enough food for everyone. Why? because they are a family. So hey, this is what happens when your church becomes a family. We look out for each other. When you hear somebody share a prayer request and say, I'm praying for this, you're like, God, could I be the answer to that prayer? 
Because that's what happens in a family. If my child says, for prayer requests at family time, devotion time, uh huh, Mwini, what's your prayer request? And then somebody says, I'm really praying for new socks because my socks have holes. Could you guys pray for me? <laughs> then we all say, okay, let's pray for let's pray for this child. Lord, provide socks for them, please. Lord, just make sure they get socks. Give them divine helpers to bring socks to them. How stupid is that family? Like, like, what is that? What are you doing? I mean, somebody would walk in and think, are you mad? You are their family. Provide socks for them. Why are you bothering God with things like those? Those are small things. Those are small things. Families provide room for generosity. If you want to be in a generous church, build families. Build families. Am I speaking good? Yeah, yeah, build family. There's nothing better than being in a family, by the way. Uh, you will feel so much love and acceptance when you're in a family. You will not even have need. People have answers. Right now, there's somebody who has an answer to somebody's prayer in this room. You're not looking convinced? There's something that you, is even disposable for you that right now can answer somebody's urgent prayer. And maybe after, after this, we should have an opportunity to give a space to answer one another's prayer. Family builds a sense of loyalty to each other and to the mission. That's what family does. Acts chapter 22, uh, 2, verse 46 to 7. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You know, it's interesting because they enjoyed working together. Something shifts when you become a family. I used to like visiting Mavuno churches back in the day. It was always fun to visit them and to preach. Nowadays, I don't like coming to your churches, by the way. I love it. I love it. Like, I love coming... Like, ask Pastor Carol. We delight when we are visiting you guys. Like, we know we are coming to Mavuno Kigali. There's just joy. Like, we are just happy. Why? Because they're not just a congregation. They're our people. We love coming to downtown. We love coming. It's such a fun place to be. We love being in Kampala. I mean, I'm, when I mention these words, they're not words. They're people to me. Like, they're, they're people I love when I think about it. When I come to Hill City, I know Jack is there. I know people's names. They are my people. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, I haven't mentioned your campus, but I've thought they have too many children. I can't mention all your campuses. But even insert your campus there. I love visiting. And you know, it's just made ministry fun. And I know many of you will actually testify, Rock, I come, Nikonjiani, I'm on my way. I love it. I mean, we were in Berlin the other day. It was so much fun. It really was. And I've been to Berlin before, and it wasn't that it wasn't fun, Pastor Daniel, but this was different. This was special. Come on. I mean, there's something that happens when you become a family. Church becomes fun. It becomes about the people around you. You can't miss. It's your family. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and we become loyal to the mission. It's no longer an option. It's like we are there together. We are dying for this thing. Uh, this is, who doesn't want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves? That's what happens to church when we love one another. Uh, it's attractive. It says in verse, 20, to verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily those who are being saved. You know, it's interesting because there are, it, it, people are just coming to the church and seeing. And they're just joining the church. It's like, I want to be part of these guys. I love what these people are doing. It's like I, I, they, they belong. I want to belong. And some of your churches, by the way, right now are growing because of the love you guys have for each other. I mean, I know there are campuses in Mavuno Church. Even I enter, I'm like, if I was not the bishop, I'd, just, I'd be here next week. You know, if I didn't have to be somewhere else next week. It's, it's like there's just a magnetism that happens. The world will come for good music. The world will come for good preaching. But the world will stay for love. Love is what will keep people in your church, by the way. When they find people who genuinely love one another. It creates a radical leadership core. Number eight. A radical leadership core. You know, it's interesting. It says, Psalm 127, verse 4 to 5, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. When you have sons and daughters, you will not be put to shame. You will have arrows in your hand. You will be a fearsome warrior. You know, it's interesting. Right now, when I look at Pastor Nyamo, I'm like, what? The, the, the arrows she has. She has an army. A small army, but a very vocal army. They yeah, are very powerful. These guys, they are, I mean, they're dangerous. Raka is in trouble. There's a radical core. There's a radical core in that church. By the way, I've never even come, but I just feel it from a distance. 
Like there's something happening in that place. And it's interesting, I was talking to Pastor Angie another day and she said, I don't, I've not even come to Raqqa, but I've heard you guys are planting Raqqa, but something in my spirit is telling me God is about to do something through that church. That's, that's a, just, that, that we had a, it's not true, Pastor Angie, you said that, didn't you? Yeah, she did, she did. I mean, God is doing something and you know why? It's because of the radical call that Pastor Nyamu has built. There's such a strong family in that church and they love each other. They will die for each other. And as a result, my goodness, the gates of hell will not prevail against these guys. Ah, my goodness, they are weapons. They are arrows in the hands of a warrior. And that's what's going to happen in all our campuses. As we become family, strong family, loving each other, my goodness, the gates of hell cannot prevail against a church like that. This is it. Creates a radical leadership core. I mean, there's a, there's a good um, illustration I remember once. This guy called John Wesley, who started the Methodist Church, and he had a compatriot, a guy who was born the same time, who lived in the same time, and was an incredible evangelist. His name was John Wilberforce. There were the two Johns. And uh, not Wilberforce, uh, John, what is his name? Whitefield. Whitefield. John Whitefield. John Whitefield was an incredible evangelist. I mean, like, it's shocking because he was so famous, he could go to a village and without any warning, a thousand people show up. He was like Jesus. Everywhere he went, there were crowds. He left the UK, went to America, had the exact same effect. I mean, if you've heard of the Great Awakening, I mean, he was part of, part of that. Pe crowds would come. There would be revivals everywhere he went. People would be saved everywhere he went. I mean, yeah, everywhere. <laughs> That's John Whitfield. I mean, he was such, like, it, he was such an amazing guy. He was the leader in that sense. He was the most known, the more famous. John Wesley was not as famous. John Wesley was, uh, he was a very methodical person. He went into a place, he formed a family, he discipled them, and then he formed another family. He formed these groups, small groups, they called them bands, uh, which were just discipleship groups. And then they would have people coming to do little gatherings and the groups would gather together. And you know what happened is slowly they just built these little networks across the world. And on the day that John Whitfield died, he said, I regret that I was not like my brother Wesley. Because by that time, Wesley's little bands had grown into a movement, a mighty movement that was now becoming the Methodist church. He didn't want to start a church, by the way. He was trying to reform the church. But the church was so harsh against them. And eventually they moved out and formed a new body. And it became the Meth Methodists. Methods. He was very good with methods. He was very methodical with discipling people. And John Whitfield said, I wish I did what my brother Wesley did. Because he said his disciples are standing strong. He said, mine are just strands of sand. Wow. And that's why you've never heard of Whitfield. Wow. The most famous evangelism of the world in his day. Nobody remembers him. Why? Because he did not build families. Wow. How, many, how, many have, I mean, how many have seen a Methodist church? Oh, yeah? Yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's all over. I mean, this Methodist Church of Kenya, it's all over. Every country in the world has a Methodist Church because somebody built families. Am I convincing somebody about the importance of family? Some of you might have been, why, why are we talking family in Mavuno Church? Why can't we just be a good church? And I'm saying God loves you too much to leave you how you are. He loves you as you are, but He loves you too much to leave you that way. Uh, it creates room for everyone. Number nine, 1 Corinthians 12:27. And it says, now you're the body of Christ and each of you, okay, I don't know what version you're using, NKJV, you should know by now I'm an NIV type of person. Now you're the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. Thank you, thank you. Oh my goodness, you guys are fast. Who's, the, who's behind there? Well done. Let's, let's clap for that person. I like it. Thanks for flowing. Thanks for flowing. So this is, here's the thing. In a body, every part has a use. Paul has this incredible poem he writes in the, in, in the first Corinthians 12 where he talks about the hand cannot say to the eye, I don't need you. And he says the parts that are least presentable are the most important. You know, it's very interesting. Some of you spend hours on your face. But do you know that there's a little part of your body that you never see and you've never paid any attention to? You've never even spent any money making it feel good. And if that part stopped functioning right now, you'd just fall and die. I'm, you know what I'm talking about? There are little parts of your body that are not presentable. They're even hidden. But they're the ones that are causing you to move. That face of yours, it could be wiped off and you'll still be there. 
Yeah, you, the, the parts that are most presentable, the parts we give the most attention to are not necessarily even the most important parts in your body. Wow. There are little glands that are in there that just produce a few drops of liquid all the time. That's what they're doing. And that gland you cannot do without. Wow. And, the body is say, and, and the Bible is saying every part has a purpose in the body. You can't say because we're the eyes, we're put makeup. We're the beautiful ones. Everybody says, what beautiful eyes. And, and, and you can't say to the eyes can't say to the rest of the body, we don't need you. We're the attraction, we're the main attraction of this body. I mean, imagine you just saw some eyes moving in the darkness, coming towards you. What would you do? You'd run. It doesn't matter how beautiful they are. In fact, the more beautiful, the more you run, isn't it? The eyes need the rest of the body to be presentable. So we need each other. In the body, every part has a role. And that's one of the beautiful things about the body. It's very interesting because it's easy to think that Pastor M is the part of the body that is most eloquent. You might find that the reason God is blessing this family is because there's an intercessor right now in a tent somewhere who's praying. Wow. And the reason God is blessing is because there's a sound man making sure you even hear Pastor M in the first place. Every part is important. There's no part that is less important than the other. And that's the beauty of a family. When you're a family, every part counts. We don't leave anyone behind. Everyone is important. Quenches negativity, number 10. I'm doing, I'm doing till 12. So this is number 10. It quenches negativity. Being a family quenches negativity. First Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. I love that verse. When we're a family, we forgive. We know. <laughs> it's interesting, today my brother is here. I have one brother. <laughs> I don't have any other brother in the world. So it doesn't matter how many good friends I have. There's only one brother that I have that my parents gave me. I'm completely loyal to him. Like, you know what? He didn't earn that loyalty. He doesn't call it. It's not because he applied somewhere for that loyalty. But he's the one. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He's one brother. He's the one we grew up. We came from the same womb. We grew up together in the same house. We were punished with the same belt. <laughs> okay, too much information, right? <laughs> like, like, we went through so, like, he's my brother. He's the only one I have. So, because of that, it doesn't matter what he does. He's still the only brother I have. Are you understanding? That's, that's, that's it. It's finished. I mean, it doesn't matter how he offends me. He's, I will still have to come back to him because he's the only brother I have. And it's the same in the family of God. We need one another. When you offend me, if Pastor Angie offends me, it'll hurt me. In fact, you hurt more when it's somebody close than when it's a stranger. But you know what? That's not the reason to withdraw. Because somebody hurt me. In fact, that shows me how important they were that they were able to hurt me. And how much more I need them. So if there's a person in your campus who has offended you and caused you not to come to church or caused you not to serve in a certain ministry, that shows you how important they are to you and how much you need them and why the devil would spend so much time to cut you away from that family. You need one another. That's what family is for. We need one another. It quenches that negativity. It quenches that thing of I can't go back. No, you have to go back. You only have one family. You can't be cut off from it. Am I talking to somebody in the house right now? Maybe I need to do an altar call right now. Yeah, you've been sitting in the back right now. You're like, I can't serve because of what the pastor said to me. No, that's how much you need that person. Wow. You need to lean forward. You need your church. You need one another. That's why we're a family. When we're a family, we can't leave one another. Family is forever. Family is forever. Number 11, it's much more fun. I like this one. I save the best ones for last. It's much more fun. Psalm 133, we just talked about that. Psalm 127, verse 3 to 5. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring are a reward. I love that scripture. Your children are a gift. Like, so, let me tell you something. When people become your children, they become your gift. When Pastor Sheila enters my house, I smile. Yeah, because she's my daughter. Like, I have no choice. I mean, she's my daughter. Pastor Angie, they make me happy. When Pastor Godwin and Pastor Noel come into my house, ask them. They'll tell you, I smile. Yeah, they're my gift. They're a blessing. Ministry is so much more fun when you're a family. Yes. Yeah, it's so much fun. You will enjoy church. You'll even wonder what you are doing all your life going to church as a church member. Yeah, you'll wonder. You'll be like, how was I wasting all those years? You know, I went to Kigali another day, and 
we had, uh, we, I was preaching in another church. And these guys, they suspended services that day and all of them came to that church. And then I love how they, I love how they do it because they're Mavuno. They start front and center. And then they're like, come on, Pastor M. Hey, and it's a, it's a mega church, by the way. All those guys are looking like, hey, who is this Pastor M? Who is this entourage he has come with? By the way, I got so much respect because of these guys. And then after a whole day of preaching, because it was a gathering, I found out they had planned dinner for me and Carol, Pastor Carol. And so they said, oh, maybe you just need to go to your hotel room. You're tired. We know you need to make up. True story, right? And I told them, hotel room where? Every minute with you guys is precious. Let's go for supper. Like, honestly, I was tired, but I was like, I could not wait to go to a hotel room and change, and my spiritual children are here. We went and sat down. Like, what time did you leave that place? Like, we just sat and talked and laughed. And I just kept thinking, Lord, where was I? You mean the other churches that have been having this kind of fun? And here I am just being a pastor and a preacher. I didn't even know I could be a spiritual father and enjoy life like this. Oh my goodness, it's so much more fun when you love people. Pastor Kelonzi talked about how Pastor God, Godwin threw us a party after their gathering. And we just went and sat and just tarried and talked. Oh my goodness. It's like you don't even want to go home because you're with family. Some of you have not experienced this yet. It is coming your way in Jesus' name. Yeah. This is what God intended for his church to be. It's a family that loves each other. And then lastly, it brings impartation and inheritance. It brings impartation and inheritance. Romans 1, 11 says, I long to see you so I may impart to you some spiritual gift that will make you strong. You know what? When you're a father, when you're in a family, you receive inheritance. Inheritance is not for servants. It's not for colleagues. It's for sons. And basically, for me, I've come to the very amazing conclusion. Because in my biological life, in the things I do in my family, I always know everything that Pastor Caro and I make, we know. We're going to die. So when you're a parent and you're working, you know I'm, make, I'm working to leave an inheritance for the next generation. I'm not going to enjoy these things. They're for other people. It's the same in the spiritual realm. When people are your spiritual sons and daughters, every blessing in your life is a blessing unto them. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. That's why we're still enjoying the blessing today. Remember, the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 8, 18, He's the one who gives you the ability to create wealth and so fulfills His covenant to Abraham. We're here making wealth with the ability to make wealth because God promised our forefather. So, so the blessing, the impartation, the inheritance comes through the lineage of sonship. And so there's inheritance. Uh, Pastor Kelonzi talked about that inheritance. There's inheritance in this family. I believe that every member of this family, <clears throat> good marriages are your portion. I am trusting God. A time is coming in Mavuno Church when this divorce will not happen in this church. Not among disciples. Maybe among the people who are watching on the periphery, but not among the disciples of this church. Anybody following Pastor Caro and I, a good marriage is your portion in Jesus' name. Yeah, it is. And you don't have to work for it. You just have to follow and be disciples and watch God give you that inheritance. It's your inheritance in Jesus' name. And so this is one of the beautiful things about being a son is that you know I'm not here for a wage. I'm here for an inheritance. In fact, sometimes servants make more than sons. In fact, not sometimes, almost all the time. <laughs> servants get wages. And it, they look like they're doing well. In fact, the son can envy the servants because they look like they get a pay check every month. But the son, the son, when that will is being read, that servant will not be in the house. Wow. It's only sons who are there for inheritance. And that's the beauty of being a family. And so every one of us, I want to implore you, be part of the family. Be part of the family. Pastor Baji, Pastor Milton is your father. Yeah. You're a great man. You're going to do great things. Yeah. You're going to change nations. Not Islam's nations. You will. God has given you the gift for that. Yeah. He's given it to you. He, will, he has already started giving you many sons and daughters. Yeah. And you will change nations. This is your father here. This is your father. Tap in. Lean in hard. Receive that inheritance and anointing. And watch what's going to happen to your ministry. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true of everyone here. Just watch it. It's not, a, it's not even something I can explain to you logically. But just lean in. Change your language. Change your focus. 
watch what God begins to do. Let me just say a few last things uh, because it's almost time for me to end. Building family. How do we serve our sons? How do we move from serving our servants to serving our sons? I'm going to give you just three things, and they're very short. Love one another, show loyalty to my leaders, share your father's heart. Those are the three things. It's, it's very simple. Number one, John 13, uh, love one another, John 13, 34. A new command I give to you, love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. I really believe that this is the first place. You must posture your heart to love. You know something, huh? Sometimes some of you are waiting for feelings of love, feelings of family, feelings of belonging. But you know what? When I tell you that this is my only brother, they are not, it's not all the time in our lives that I felt feelings of love towards him. But that doesn't change the fact that he's my brother. And when, I, when he needs me, I am there. So stop waiting for the feeling to confirm that you're part of the family. Feelings follow commitments. It's the same in marriage. Some people feel like we've fallen out of love, as if love was a hole to fall into in the first place. We don't fall in love. You know, when you stop feeling the feelings, what do you do? You act the feelings. And the more you act the feelings, the more the feelings follow you. And I, I want to just challenge anybody right now who's feeling out of love in your marriage. Make a decision. I will treat this man, I will treat this woman as if I was wildly in love with them. What would I do if I was wildly in love with them? I'd wake up early and make them breakfast. I would make sure that they're, 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 they're met well. I'll, re, I'll meet them when they come. I'd come outside and meet them at the car and help carry their bag in and tell them, I hope you're well. I'd tell them, sit down. I sh I'm sure you're tired. You've been in the office. Remove your socks. Let me just put, I've even got some warm water. Put your legs there. Then I just give you a small massage. If I was in love with them, that's what I'd do, isn't it? So pretend for a moment that you're in love and start to do those things. You know what happens? <laughs> Pastor Kelonzi's legs are already up. <laughs> As you do those things, you know what happens? Feelings follow the commitment. Watch it. Just do it for a while. Do it for a while. You know, you might think this is theory. But around year five of our marriage, Pastor Kara and I had gone through a bit of a crisis. And many couples go through a crisis in their marriage where, you, where the feelings are no longer there. And we were having conflict after conflict. And you know, at some point I felt, my goodness, did I make a mistake? Are pastors allowed to make a mistake? I actually thought about that because I thought, unfortunately, the whole church was there at our wedding. They had me say, till death do us part. What option do I have at this point? By the way, by the time you're thinking like that, things are thick. Like things were elephants in our marriage. And I'm thinking, how will we get out of this? It's just not working. Every conversation we, we, we have is more heat than light. Like, like we just end up, I just say something small. Something small, ridiculously small. Like, hey, this water is very hot, eh? I'm even the one who had to pay for electricity last month because you forgot. This water was heated by that electricity. <laughs> Tokens were... <laughs> by the way, it's, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. The place in marriage, you get to that place where you're walking on eggshells. And you're just thinking, oh God, I could say something and I'm in trouble. And you're wondering, what am I even doing here? I'm miserable. And I remember at that point that she and I, in fact, I thank God for this woman because she's the one who really did some things that helped us. She started doing a class on counseling, on marriage, marriage and family therapy. And I started listening to her notes. Like, I, I was desperate. I was just reading what she was reading. And I remember somebody teaching this principle. So I decided I'm going to make a decision from now on in our marriage. And I said, I'm going to treat my wife as if I'm wildly in love with her. I didn't have the feeling but I began to do it. And she can tell you this is true. I made a commitment every morning. It doesn't matter what we talked about the night before. It doesn't matter whether I got to bed feeling so irritated. I'd wake up, I'd hug her and kiss her and tell her I love you. Wow. Every morning. Before I left the house, if I hadn't done it, even if I'd done it, before I left the house, I would hug her and kiss her and tell her I love you. When I came home in the evening, I would hug her and kiss her and tell her I loved her. And then I even, began, I even put notes on my phone, like alarms, because you know guys are like that. We can't be spontaneous. 
So I put alarms. But then I was even wise because I knew if it comes at 11 o'clock every day, it will be suspicious. So I put one Monday, 9.03, and then 11.25. Tuesday, 10.05, and 5.15. Wednesday, and then I would just send a text and say, honey, I love you. And at first, it was those ones of, honey, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Why? It's not I love you. I love you more. It's thank you. And you're like, hey, it's even hard for her. I say I love you at this point. By the way, I say this not in any. It's not even my wife was. In, it's it's because I had been so mean to her that I think I'd really hurt her. It's not her fault. I'd really hurt her. I'd, I'd said harsh things. I'm a strong personality. I was trying to form her into what I wanted her to be, and she was not willing to go that way. And I was angry at that. I realized this later. But you know what? I changed my posture. And I just said, I love you. And I found ways to serve her. And I said, I love you. And then I'd ask her, Do you, and I'd, I'd say, you know, I love you. And she'd, she'd say, ah, ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, I said it over and over. Yeah, I love you, noted. <laughs> I did it over and over. And I can't tell you whether it was a year or it was two years, but I did it. It became a habit. She even knew. Sometimes she'd even be asleep and she'd say, because she knows I'm going to kiss her. I don't know how she just says, don't wake me up. Just put the kiss and go, you know. And I would do it. It's like, it's just like clockwork. I just acted my way into loving her. And you know what happened? One day I remember, I'll never forget this day. I said, Carol, do you know I love you? And Carol said, I completely, absolutely know that. Wow. I was like, I was like, huh? By the way, I had tears. I was like, huh? You do? <laughs> And you know, the thing about it is, in all seriousness, there had been such a, I'd caused so much harm that it's almost like I was acting my way from negative into positive. I was getting out of the red. And it's like every little deposit was just building and building and building until one day she said, I get it. I know you love me. You don't even need to say it. I know, I know, I know you love me. And you know, some of you, that's exactly where you are with God right now. That's where you are with serving. That's where you are with sonship. It's like, I don't feel it. I want to serve. I want to love pa 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 Pastor Kelonzi. I want to love Pastor Milton, but I, I have so many wounds wow. from my last church, even from things he said. I don't feel like a son. I don't feel like a daughter. Hey, come on. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Act like one. Wow. Start acting like a, like a daughter. Get his, get his bag when you see him and carry it. Find out how can I... Get him water when he's walking. Find ways to serve him. Find a gift and send it to him just like you would your own biological parent. Just act your way into family. Love one another. That's what Jesus is saying. Love one another as I have loved you. What does that mean? Jesus didn't love us by, by being mushy. Oh, come for a hug, group hug. That's not how Jesus loved us. Jesus loved us enough that he died. He died. He gave up himself for us. That's what he means by love one another. Act. Do it even with people who are ungrateful. Do it with people who are not appreciating it. Just act your way into loving your father. This is how we become a family, by the way. You may not be feeling your church right now, but act like you love them. Come into your leaders' meetings and sit in front. Don't sit at the back. Have a notebook and take notes, even though you don't feel like taking notes. And you know what's going to happen? Something is going to start shifting. That's the illustration that Pastor Kevin gave us earlier about Sumit. Because he just basically said, do it. Just go and make, make a decision to do it and start doing it. And I bless God for you, sir. Because I want to pop. Come on, let's appreciate Sumit. Yeah, I love that he did that. Amen. Thank you so much. And thank you, Pastor Kilonzi, for being brave enough to just say, just go ahead and do it. It's not about feeling. Just do it. See what God begins. Am I, am I helping somebody in the house? Yeah, just begin to do it. Number two, show loyalty to your leaders. Show loyalty to your leaders. Hebrews 13 verse 17, it says something very powerful. It says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to the authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. It's of no benefit to you when your parents are stressed about you. It's of no benefit to you when the person who's meant to be standing and interceding on the gap for you is worried about you because you're not you're not playing your part in the family. You know, some of you and some of us, let me say some of us, were the children who stressed our parents. I'm just looking to see some affirmation from some guilty looks. Uh -huh. 
When your parents were on their knees praying, it was you. You were their source of prayer. When, they, when your parents grew in prayer, it was because of you. <laughs> you are the reason. You are that special reason. You are so stressful as a child. You know what? It doesn't, they were not joyful. It became so hard for them to lead you. They did it because it was their duty, not because they enjoyed it. What a horrible thing to do to your parents. Yeah. Don't make it hard for your pastors to love serving you. Don't make it hard for your discipleship group leader to love leading you. Some of you are in a discipleship group. It's a new group. You know what you do when you're there? Sit up. Help your leader. Make sure they succeed. Respond well when nobody else is responding. Respond to that text when everybody else is quiet. Model to the rest how to follow. Guess what? The best followers make the best leaders. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to find that God is going to elevate you as you do that. This is what God wants for every one of us. That's my commitment, by the way. I never enter a space that belongs to someone else to be a bystander. Wow. I've sat on boards, and one of the things I do when I enter somebody's board is I tell the CEO, I'm here to help you succeed. I will never fight you. If I'm fighting you, then one of us is unnecessary in this organization. And so I say, when, I, when you see me walking in here, know that I'm here to help you succeed. I'm your follower. Wow. That's what I say. Because I'm, I, I don't want to be that other head in the organization, making the CEOs work hard because instead of worrying about the bottom line, they're worrying about their board. And there are many boards that frustrate CEOs, make it hard for them to do their job. So I'm, I just said, wherever I go and I'm a follower, I will follow hard. Whoever leads me will be glad that I'm on that team. Make it your commitment. Maybe even at work, you're on a team right now. Any team I'm posted to, the leader will be happy I'm in that team. Amen. Yeah, yeah, that's not, the, that's not the operation in your office. Everybody else sabotages leaders and tries to act like it's not their responsibility. Be different. And guess what happens? The Lord will lift you up. Yeah, Jesus. That's what Jesus did. He considered himself as nothing, equal to God, considered nothing. Guess what happens? Therefore, God raised him up and gave him the name that is above every name. That's the model God has given us. So number two, show loyalty. Show loyalty and lead others. Be concerned. Be on time. Be enthusiastic. When your leader says, stand on your video, actually, they shouldn't even have said, but by now, if your leader is having to say to you, you're a bad follower, your video should already be on because you know that's what your leader is happy with, isn't it? So when you come into the meeting, come on. Don't make it hard for them. Don't make them have to announce it. Be one of those ones who's different. Lean forward. Honor them. Be concerned about them. Follow hard. Be known for following hard. Be that person who follows hard. Number three, share your father's heart. Finally, share your father's heart. Galatians chapter 4 verse 7 says, So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God has also made you an heir. You're an heir of God. So act like one. Be an heir in the family. What does God want in your church? God wants disciples. Isn't it? That's your father's heart. Your father wants disciples. Be a disciple maker. Don't wait for the pastor to say, oh, we need discipleship group leaders. Come on, somebody. That's, not, that's, that's my job description. That's why I'm on earth. Why, I'm, why is Pastor James begging me to come and be a disciple maker, and yet I'm here on earth for that one reason? Be a discipleship group leader. Don't, you volunteer yourself. Don't wait to be called. Be keen to multiply. Invite friends to church because you know God wants people in the church to be saved. Spread Jesus' influence. Be a, a soldier in the army of Jesus. You don't have to wait for your pastor to invite you. You should be one of those people who's like, you know what, any, any church I go to, the pastor will be happy I'm in that church. Yeah, that's how you become that person who shares your father's heart. By the way, as I'm speaking, I know I'm speaking to the choir. Because many people here, you're doing all those things and more. When I go into a Mavuno church nowadays, it's night and day. There's a difference. I feel warmth. I feel following. I feel people who love one another. In this family, there's so much love. In this family, there's so much joy. In this family, there's so much oneness. And it feels, the it feels like it's the same family. Whether it's in Berlin, whether it's in Bujumbura, I feel the same. There's a kinship that is happening in this season as we're loving one another. So as I'm teaching you this stuff, guys, I'm not, I know I'm teaching the choir. The people who are already here, you're the people who are practicing that thing. And what I want you to do is become the agents of it to the rest of the church. Every church has all those tears. And right now, many of you are already in the family. The people who are already in this house, you're already in the family. But you know what? We have to model family so the rest of the people, the attenders, the members, they want to become family as well. Let's be in the business of building the family of God in the compass God has put us. Amen? Amen. I want to pray for us. This is day one. 
and today was about family and I really believe that God wanted us to hear his voice and just understand why family is so important because we get stuck when we don't understand family there are many members of your church who are not here and who are not haven't watched this online you are going to be you're going to have to be the one who teaches them this stuff so I want to ask you to also lean forward as I'm teaching take your notes because you're going to teach this to other people and help other people become part of the family but I want you to just do a, a thing for me for one minute I actually want you to turn to the person next to you and say what have I had today what's one thing I've heard God say today that I want to action something that I've heard God say that I want to act in obedience towards so if you could just stand to your neighbors in twos or threes we'll just have a bit of a debrief if you're watching in a watch party do the same let's just what is one thing that I believe God wants me to action and then we're going to just end and conclude day one together. One thing God wants us to action. Something that has struck me today that I believe God wants me to do different going forward. Just one thing you hear God saying. Let me ask the tech team if you could have a couple of mics just to get some feedback. Make sure you give the other person room as well to share. I know some of your neighbors are saying very profound things. I'd like to just give a moment to just get a few, sample, sample a few um, comments from you. Some of you had neighbors who said very, very, very profound things. And so maybe you, you have something a neighbor said that was very profound or you said something profound. So let's just maybe get a couple of people who, and if your neighbor doesn't put up your hand, you should feel very offended because they're saying you didn't say anything very profound to them. Uh, but uh, that's okay. Just don't catch feelings. They just clearly don't think you're that deep. Can we get a few people? Just put up your hand. Okay, I can see somebody at the front here. Uh, somebody else on this side. Okay, there's someone on this side over here. Someone in the middle here. Okay, thank you. Somebody on that end. Is there someone there? Does this end have anybody profound? Are there any deep guys on that? Okay, there's a hand there. All right. Let's start over here on this side. Yeah, hi. So can we just listen for a minute? We'll continue after. 
Yeah. So I'd like to share what uh, my neighbor said, Angie Morenga. She said she's already, she has sons and daughters. And the funny thing about Angie, for her to follow is not hard. Yeah. She, it's not to obey is not hard. Yes, she will go kicking, but she will obey. So what she has, she's taking out of here is to take all this that she has learned and go and teach her sons and daughters. Amen. Because if, she's an, if she obeys and follows what you're saying, then it will automatically trickle down, just like you talked about the, the beard, uh, the oil flowing from the Aaron's yeah. beard up yeah. and down. So it's going to be an amazing time for I her and for all for her, the people who are following her. I love it. Have I represented you well? Come on, let's appreciate Pastor Angel. Thank you for that. What a great takeout. Take what you're learning and teach it. And by the way, you always learn more when you teach others. So I really like that feedback. Okay, somebody over here. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay. Um, so my neighbor, Lois, mentioned um, how sometimes you take for granted the people who lead us. Can you hear her? Just put the mic next, put it closer to your mouth, yeah. yeah. Okay, my neighbor was mentioning how sometimes we take for granted the people who lead us um, and we don't honor or represent that, show that gratitude or obedience. We don't have that quick obedience. Yeah. So she was just talking about making intentional steps to make sure that that's known, that's appreciated and that we see them. Amen. Yeah. Come on, let's appreciate That's a great word. Thank you. How do we honor? How do we make sure our leaders are enjoying leading us? All right, there's somebody on this end. That's me. And I can see someone at the back as well after that. Uh -huh. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Pastor Penina from uh, Connect. Come on, Pastor Penina. My parents are here. Woo yeah, my, uh, Rita from uh, Connect as well as Irene. And we all agreed that we want to, to follow our father's heart. And our father, Pastor Victor, speaks about growing the church. Yeah. He talks about reaching out and bringing people to church. He says where we are now, a place that can host 200 plus people, he says that is the kids church. Come on. That is Mavuno Connect Kids Tent. Yeah. And so we want to fill that up and we also want to be finishing his sentences when he's speaking because, <laughs> because we know his heart. And we want to follow hard. We love you, Pastor Victor. Come on. I love it. Do you know your father's heart? Do you know what your church father, what their heart is? What is their passion? Do you even know that? And I love that you guys are saying we want to lean into that and we want to be part of that. Somebody at the back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, Pastor M, I think for us as we're discussing, what's standing out is one, two, Reduce the bass on his voice. He already has natural. <laughs> One is to, to first love, love the people that God has given us. And just sharing that family visitation, engaging with them. Yeah. But more than that, to teach them what it is that we are learning. Well, I think a big thing here is aligning to our fathers. I think one of the most profound things I've had today or we've had today is that even you, when you enter a space, you say, I am here as a follower. I'm not here to fight you. Yeah. And that originality is overrated. That for us was profound. I love it. Well done. Thank you so much, Pastor CJ. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You can create family even at work. These are not skills. These are kingdom skills that apply even in the corporate world. When you're a head of a department, create a family and you'll be amazed at the productivity in your department. If people love each other, they know that they care for each other, you do, you visit people, and people feel, my goodness, I'm loved here. You'll be shocked how productivity will go through the roof. Family is important. I can see, was there one or two others? Were there any other hands? Okay, I can see somebody on this side, and then somebody right at the very back, and somebody on that corner there. All right, my name is Ben Waimani, and... Uh... Come on, Ben Waimani. <laughs> ben was in our video on Sunday, if you guys yes. noticed. Yes, he featured. Mashariki people didn't see that. Oh, man. We had a challenge with our project. Yes, I remember. So, yes. to learn a YouTube. Anyway, <laughs> um, mine is when you talked about frontline initiatives. Uh, they started as God's movement and then turning into NGOs. 
simply because there is no family. Yeah. And I'd like to just share something that happened during serving this time under Jukumu Lako. And have you ever been in a space where you've borrowed sound from church, they've confirmed they'll give you sound, and then you've even uh, uh, gone and decided this is what I'll pick, this is what I'll pick, and this is what I'll pick. And then the day before the event, you've confirmed, the pastor says, yes, it's okay. And then the day of ministry, in the morning, Pasi calls you and then he's like, Aitawezekana. It's not possible. Ouch. So most of the times, a lot of people will take offense, even from churches as you're leading your frontline initiatives. Yeah. Yeah. But what has really helped me is to have that heart of not being offended easily, simply because there's a reason as to why it was not possible. But then sometimes we feel entitled, sometimes we're like, ah, if the church cannot support me, then I'm off. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thank God from the fact that we started talking about family and growing because now we do it together. If today I don't have sound, Mavuno Connect will give me sound yeah. and just do it. As in, it's, it's become more of intimacy and, and helping one another to grow and to reach out. And it, become, it becomes easy for you to reach out even to more and more people. Yeah. yeah so, Whatever I'm going to do about it, continue praying so that you don't have the heart of being offended easily. Amen. Wow. You can, you can either, you, you know, people, you know, you actually have to, you have a choice to take offense. People can give you offense, but it's you as a choice to take it. And what he's saying is you don't always have to take offense, even when it's given intentionally or unintentionally. And I just want to say to you, Ben, that that ministry is going to grow big. It's going to become a movement. It won't be a ministry, it will be a movement. And to be a movement under this pastor here. Wow. Under his guidance, you will see that thing becoming a movement that will be bigger than anything you could ever imagine. Wow. What we saw in PG, you're going to see happen many times over in your season. Yeah, that's, that's my word to you. Watch God fulfill it. Amen. Follow this man hard. Thank you. There's a guy at the back there. Uh, praise God. Amen. Uh, lots of takeouts by there. So basically, um, I've learned that you don't have to be perfect to to be part of this great family. A uh, family just needs love uh, and loyalty. And uh, God won't answer every each and every prayer. Some some are, are there to be answered by us in a family. Like, for instance, if I have a brother who doesn't have a pair of socks. That's upon me to uh, answer that prayer on their behalf instead of putting hands on it. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Thank you. We, we answer each other's prayers. One final one. I can see somebody there. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. For me, you might need to add my bass. I don't, I don't have enough. <laughs> I haven't broken my voice yet. I'm still waiting. Uh, David Courier, uh, campus pastor at Mavuno Lovington. Come on, Pastor Courier. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for me, I think what, what has really struck me is from the, um, the graphic, the level of family. And I was just thinking about how the, the ethos and the motto of our generation is individuality yeah. and individualism. It's you do you. Yeah. You do you, I'll do me. And, and that's how we are, even on you know, social media. I'm like, I choose who I follow, yeah. and I can even choose who follows me. Yeah. And uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of how we live. But as you look at that graphic, it really flies in the face of everything that our, gen that our generation is learning and is teaching. Because this teaches about being planted in a space. Yeah. It teaches about following. And I think for me, one of the things that's really struck me is to say my individualism or my desire to be an individual can completely stand in the way of God actually using me yeah. speaking to me, because I'll never be planted. Yeah. I'll never be planted in a family. I'll never be part of anything larger than just myself. Yeah. And somehow okay. there could be a, a grace that God has uh, over my community, over my family, over this movement. But because I'm such an individual, and I, I want to think for me. Yeah. I, I don't want to follow, I, you know, because surely even me, I have a brain. You know, even me, I can read the Bible and I can interpret it for myself. Yeah. And my, my inability or my desire not to follow can be the thing that stands in the way. Yes. So when I think about, you know, we talk about ease and acceleration, family impact. 
It's almost like unless I'm following, unless I'm planted somewhere and I say, you know what, I am going to um, almost like bow down to this, then it'll go over me yeah. because I'm an individual. And I think for me, the thing is you, you have to fight that desire for individualism and wow. you have to fight that desire to be, to be yourself and think for yourself because that's what the, everything around us is telling us. Yes. And somehow this word is saying, no, you actually have to listen. You have to follow, and that's when you receive what God has for you. Wow, wow. Come on, Pastor Curry, you're preaching good. That's so awesome. You know, it's interesting. Part of what led me into this journey, some people ask, Pastor Emma, what made you start going this way? Part of what I did is I got to a place where I began to want more. And I just began to ask God, why are there movements of the kingdom in Brazil, in South Korea, in Nigeria, in Philippines? in India, and there are none in East Africa. Global movements, churches that have started churches in 200 countries in, and send out missionaries all over the world. There are none in East Africa. And I said, you know, I mean, I'm, next week I'm going to be in Nigeria with a bunch of people from here, by the way. I think there's quite a few of you who are coming. I think there's probably about 27 strong uh, of us who are going to be rocking Lagos. Come on, somebody. Uh, this coming week, we leave on Sunday, by the way. And... Um, it's interesting because part of why I take people there is to see the difference. Uh, you've been there, Pastor Angie. I mean, there's a street where on one street, I counted maybe seven churches. And all those have global impact. As in, this one has churches in 150 countries. This one has churches in 200 countries. This one has churches. And you're wondering, what, are these people crazy? Is God a Nigerian? What is up? Like, what's going on? I mean, how come we're not there? And you know, in, back in the day, I'll be honest, and I've got a Nigerian daughter, so she understands, she's forgiven me already before I say this. I used to think that Nigerians, the reason there are so many Nigerian churches is because there are too many Nigerian uneducated people who are just following. Because like Pastor Kuri, I thought following is for people who are not educated. So I assume these are just lower class people who follow, and that's why these things are so many. I mean, Nigerian churches everywhere. What a shock. You go into those Nigerian churches, you're going to see these guys next week. Like the average Nigerian pastor has a PhD in some rocket science. Not theology, by the way. They tell you I got it from Carnegie Mellon University, from, from Wharton Business School, from London Economics Business School, have a, a dual master's and a PhD. I mean, those guys are way more educated than East Africans are and way more passionate about school than we are. And way, I mean, they're just smarter and more exposed globally than we are. In fact, at some point, I felt intimidated when he came to me to say what my credentials are. I said, I'm Moredi Wanja and I'm saved. <laughs> Let's just move on to the next person. I love Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I understood now why my parents used to use that one. It's a good one. I love Jesus as my Lord. Like, it, it's not because they're not educated. But the reason why they have become global movements is because somehow their culture has inbuilt following in it. Like, it's not even the Christian culture. Their culture had that thing. And when Christianity came, it just landed on a culture that was ready for Christianity. And as a result, they're sending out missionaries. The, the missionaries in those churches are not Bible-trained people. They're actually CEOs, UN workers, global uh, uh, multinational uh, executives, uh, artists, media, I mean, it's media personalities. Those are the people starting those churches. And you have to ask, what is different about them than us? It's because in East Africans are cast with that cast of individualism. We always think we know better than the next person, and we hate to follow anyone. And that destroys movement. And that's why you don't see global movements from the U.S. today. It does, just ask, tell me, which one church have you seen that has churches in 200 countries from the U.S.? It doesn't exist. They were there maybe in the last generation, but not in our generation. Go to Europe. There's very few. Europe has hope. And the reason I say Europe has hope is because Europe, I think that they were proud until the church died. Now that Europe is hungry enough that God is now doing movements. Because God doesn't work where people are proud. And there's enough, I think Europeans are humble enough to say, okay, let's learn. Isn't that true? And now we know some global movements in Europe that God is using in powerful ways. So this individualism, it destroys your potential. Originality is overrated, guys. 
Yeah. If we want to see God do something in our generation and to say we are part of the move of God in our generation, we have to become a family. We have to become a family. I want us to just uh, do something, the last thing we'll do today. When there's family, we love each other. And I've done this before, and I'm going to do it again. Maybe there's somebody who's in this house right now who doesn't have food for tonight. Uh, and you don't have supper and you don't have money for supper or you're just in that crisis um, because you just need food and you need you need or maybe you're just in that place where you just need a prayer uh, for that because your economics are just going really badly right now just stand up to your feet I'd like you to stand so we can pray for you as a family just stand 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 you're just in that place you're here yes we're all happy together but I'm not even sure about food for this month I'm not sure how the outlook for February is so grim. I'm not even sure we're going to have food this month. There's always one or two people like those. Yeah? Just raise your hand if you're standing because there's some people who are standing because they don't fall asleep. So just raise your hand so I can see you as well. So I can see that brother. I can see that sister. I can see that brother. Stand up if you're, if you're it. Uh, unless you're not able to stand up for some reason. I need you to just stand up right now. Yeah? Um, we want to pray for you. So just come to the front right now. Come, 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 real quick. I'm not going to embarrass you. This is a family. We love each other in this family. We care for one another in this family. We pray for one another in this family. There's no shame. We've also been in that place. People who are sitting here, have in, at one point, they were also there. So don't feel that there's anything wrong with you because you're there. The Lord will deliver you like He delivered the rest of these people. Amen. Amen. Just stand here and face, face, your, face your family. Yeah, there's several of us. Spread, spread out that way. Yeah, spread out so that there's space. Yeah. Amen. Come on, come quickly, those who are coming. Please, brother. S spread this way, spread this way, spread this way. Yeah. Let's appreciate them one more time. We thank God for them. Yeah. We're going to trust God because we know that the gifts of God are that He is our provider. And we're going to trust God that he will be Jehovah Jireh, your provider. And that situation you're in, the Lord will deliver you from it. We're going to trust God with you, that the Lord will do that. But because we're also a family, we're also going to trust God that we will, he will provide that answer before we pray it through us. So I want to just ask us, this is the last thing we're going to do today before we go home. I'm going to ask you to reach into your handbag, get some money. If you have some money, I don't want us to crowd around one person. Can you spread out a bit? I want us to spread out. Spread out a bit, all the way to the end. Yeah, just go, 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 go. Yeah, till there. Don't be, yeah. You guys can, it's okay. Stop there, stop there, sister. Just stop right there. Okay. You guys spread out a bit that way. I want you not to be too near each other. Takam kuena space katikatienyu. Mwacheni ka space katikatienyu. Kwe kuja karibu. Smama apa. Come a bit closer, sister. Stand there. Ivo too. Mwacha ka space. Ivo. All right, so what I'm going to ask us to do, just reach into your bag, reach out to your pocket, reach into your m if you have a phone, and then we're just going to take a moment, come up, and as the Lord leads you, come to one of them. Uh, we're, not going to, we're going to trust God that what He gives them will be exactly what they need. So it's not about us meeting the need, it's the Lord meeting the need through us. Amen. So just come up, come up, come up, come up. Let's just do that real quick because we don't have too much time. Just come up to every one of them. If you have a word, maybe you don't have money, but you have a word to say, an encouragement, just say that word, say it briefly and give that person that word. Sometimes it's silver and gold, I have none, but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's the blessing of God upon you. If you have a phone, you can come and just ask them for their phone number and give it to them real quick and move to the next person. Make sure somebody, you're going to somebody, if somebody has someone already, you can go to somebody different. We're trusting God that we will just give them what they need, what is enough for their need. Yeah. Give the need and then move. Just give it and then move. If you need to pray, pray a short prayer and then move. But let's make sure we meet the needs of those in our family who are struggling, who don't have what it takes. We're trusting God to multiply the seed that we sow in their lives and to be enough. They came and they spent time in God's house today. Let's trust God that there will be no, no need among them. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. It doesn't have to be much. Don't be embarrassed. If all you have is a small seed, sow it in their lives.
trust God. There's somebody here. There's a brother who's here as well. Yeah. Let's just, just walk to somebody. Maybe the Lord will give you a heart for one of the people. It's okay. You can wait for them and go to that particular person. that the Lord of provision would help our brothers and sisters. Maybe some of them need work. Maybe some of them are in a difficult place right now with housing, whatever it is. As we've given of our materials, let's just begin to pray that the Lord would actually make it possible for whatever need they have. Some of you have not been able to give because you, are not, you just have just what you had or you didn't even have anything, but you have prayer. Come on, just speak a prayer right now. Raise a prayer. Pray that your God, the God who has supplied your needs will also supply their needs that there will be no need among us. 
that all of us will be supplied for in all our churches, that God's people will have the resource that they need to do the work that they need to do, that every family here will be amply provided for. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jehovah Jireh, you're our provider. You're able to provide. Lord, come and just provide for your children. Ah, Lord, we're just prophesying right now that, Father God, something is going to break through for them, Lord. Some of them need jobs. I pray that, Lord, they're going to get breakthrough, even this week, Lord. Some of them are here when they should be working, but they just came because they, they had to be in God's house. I pray that, Lord, you'd reward those who are in God's house today. They will seek you and find you, Lord. They will find solutions in you. You will bless them, Lord. You will bless them, Lord. I pray that they will know they're not walking alone, that there are people who are standing with them. Oh, come on, just raise a prayer for your people, for these are your, your brothers and sisters. Imagine them being the brothers and sisters that were born in your house. How would you pray differently? Pray that way right now. Pray for the God of provision to provide. Pray that He would come through for them. This is the God we serve. He wants us to be a family. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're doing it right now, Jesus. You're doing it right now, Jesus. You're doing it right now, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. So, Father, we just want to thank you as a family. We thank you that you've told us to stand with one another. I pray that in this same way we will stand with one another in our compasses, Lord. That there will be no need among us. That God's people in the house of God will always be provided for. I pray that, Lord, you'd not just give us resources to give, but you'd also give us opportunities in our workplaces. Some of us are able to get opportunities in our workplaces and bring them to the house of God and say, I've got employment opportunities. And that people in the house of God will have good jobs because they're God's children. And God has put me in a place where I can be a provider. I can be like my father. My father is a provider. I am created to be a provider. And Lord, I pray that your as your children, we will provide for one another. Lord, I want to pray for every hand that has given, every heart that has prayed over others. I thank you because God, you are not a debtor to any person. That Lord, when you entrust us with your resources, that we can use them for your work and we are faithful, that Lord, you always bless us with more. And so I'm declaring over your houses that you will be provided for in Jesus' name. I'm praying over you that you will never lack. I pray that your wine would never run dry. I declare that your oil would not run out, that your house will have more than enough in 2023, that you will see Jehovah Jireh as your provider. Hey, I declare your house is provided for in Jesus' name. As you have blessed, as you have poured into others, it is poured unto you right now. Press down, shaken together and running over. Our Lord, I pray, God of provision, provide for your people. And I pray that, Lord, you don't give them just enough for them. Give them enough so that they can be generous on every occasion. Lord, don't just give them jobs. Give them employment opportunities for others. And I pray that, Lord, all our families, all our churches will be places of provisions, oasis of provisions, because God's people are provided for so they can provide for others. And so, Lord, I'm praying for each of these who's up here, that, Father God, they will testify in their churches. They will testify in their compasses of a miracle of God because we've prayed for them together. And we bless you, God's people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. Thank you so much. Let's just appreciate them as they go. We bless God for them. Now we're going to be praying. Uh, we're going to have ministry time. Uh, so, by the way, we're going to be praying for the sick. So if you're sick or if you know somebody who's sick, we're going to, we're going to have ample time. Actually, tomorrow morning, we're going to start at 6. We're going to have prayers. Uh, I have a feeling that those prayer meetings in the mornings are going to become miracle places. So, so just come early, come ready, come with you. Don't come running in at six because you're late. Come in a few minutes early so you're ready and you're prepared for what your father is going to do. They're going to be rich times. Uh, tomorrow we're going to start getting into the agenda of why we are here. The thing that God wants to give us so that we can be strong and do exploits. And so from tomorrow going into Friday and into Saturday, we're going to get into the meat. Today was just the setting the, the stage, getting us ready for the thing that God wants to do. But tomorrow, tell your neighbor, tomorrow, tomorrow. 
Tomorrow is when it really begins. So make sure you're here bright and early. If you've got friends who need to be here, make sure they're here. If you're online and you're near us and you can come, come on, take, off, take time off work. It's worth it to be here. There's nothing that is, it's not the same. You can be here. If you can be here, be here. And if you're in a watch party, be there tomorrow as well because I believe it's going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal day. So God bless you. And oh my goodness, enjoy the rest of the evening. Relax, rest. Father God, give your children rest. If there are any here who have struggled with sleep, we cancel that in Jesus' name. And I declare good sleep tonight so that you'll walk into this place refreshed and ready to hear God's word. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.